What's going on, y'all? Today's guest is Benji Stein, the, the founder and CEO of a company called Playlist Supply. Everyone's trying to get on those Spotify playlists, and Benji has the perfect platform for you. It's, it's a really amazing platform. I love this platform and how much information and research you can get from Playlist Supply. So I definitely put my stamp of approval on that huge advocate. And, you know, in this conversation, we talk about Spotify playlists, right? Good best practices on reaching out to playlist curators, how to, where to reach out to playlist curators and how to find them, the different types of playlists, um, some issues with, with Spotify that, that, you know, issues such as mistakes that a lot of artists make and how artists get connected with the wrong similar artists by some of these mistakes that they make. And, we get into a little bit into playlist pluggers, the different types of playlists on Spotify. Uh, Benji has a background in, in artist management. We'll dive a little bit into that and why he wanted to create the company Playlist Supply. And I'll share a resource to a tutorial to Playlist Supply as well that, that they made in the show notes. And you can find those show notes at makingitwithchrisg.com forward slash podcast forward slash 127 for episode number 127. I'll also have links to Playlist Supply and everything in there as well. And you can find Playlist Supply at playlistsupply.com. Sign up there. It's only 20 bucks a month. Again, a really, really great resource. And it will save you a ton of time in finding contacts for all these different playlist curators for all these different types of playlists, right? And Thank you all so much for listening. Please take a quick moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us a lot and get reach new new listeners, new followers, get paired with the right podcast, which we talk a little bit about in this episode, how, how I got paired with the wrong podcasts. Uh, but really fun conversation. Could have gone gone on for a long time talking to Benji. I have many more questions, but I feel like you're going to learn a lot from this episode. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with the amazing Benji Stein. <laughs> Live the life you love. All right, we are live. I'm excited to introduce everyone to Mr. Benji Stein. Benji, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I'm really excited to go into the company that you started, uh, Playlist Supply. But before we get there, I want to go a little bit into to your background and some info about Spotify, issues with Spotify that artists deal with. But you also have, you have a background in artist management. Tell me a little about that. Do you still manage artists or did you just do that in the past before starting this company? Tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of, you know, back when I was in college, I like, I started management kind of inadvertently. I had a friend of mine who was a singer songwriter slash producer. And, you know, he was, he's someone who's my best friend and still is someone I'm very close friends with. And it kind of started like a lot of management kind of uh, you know, you you kind of hear this story a lot um, with managers, but he was someone who was a good friend of mine who just needed someone who like knew marketing and kind of who who knew kind of the the realm of getting the music out there. And he's very creative focused and he doesn't have kind of the same mentality. It, like he doesn't have the same prowess with the marketing and kind of the, the branding himself. And so it kind of naturally just started as me helping a friend and I ended up, you know, his career kind of grew a little bit and I, I grew with it and I grew into that management role more and more. And yeah, I, I also ended up doing a couple small stints at record labels, just like doing kind of starting with intern work and then some assistant work. And, you know, my my goal with that was to kind of learn more of how the professional industry moved. And yeah, I've, I've also since then I've worked as a part of some larger management teams that that manage some like pretty significant hip hop acts. And yeah, I um I still manage I still manage that same artist that was my friend back at back in the day. And I also manage a couple other clients. I have a, a producer that I manage and I'm currently developing a small act. That's kind of like a band. And yeah, I I'm management for me is definitely something that's not like there's some time, there's some people that are career managers and that's like their, their full time and that's their total mm -hmm. focus. But for me, it's kind of just been something that goes hand in hand with the other stuff I do, which is like a lot of marketing, a lot of creative direction and I kind of have a skill set that just applies itself well to to management as well but i don't like to see myself as someone that's like exclusively a manager like i definitely like to be kind of like a you know i, I like to be more hand in hand as someone that's kind of you know telling the artist what to do like i i definitely prefer to be more like a cooperation and yeah that's kind of like that's kind of like how i got into management and th i think that's a really common story for a lot of people Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And where did the, the interest in in tech start? Because you're basically, you're running a tech company. So 
where did the interest in that come? Did you always, were you always interested in tech? Do you know how to, like, did you learn how to code or do you have a partner that helped help do all the coding for the site? Like where did the tech interest come from? Yeah. So I'm, I've always been like very interested in tech. I don't know how to code, but you know, I've for a long time, like I, I like, I learned how to torrent music at a super young age. And I've like, I like spent a lot of time like downloading software, like illegally. And I like know how to use like all of the Adobe suite and just like, you know, I, I like, I built multiple computers, like from when I very first started getting into them. And I've definitely been interested in tech. And I think it's also something that kind of like, it's not it just be like coding itself is not, is just like one realm of it, but a lot of it is kind of just also like, understanding the way platforms work and mm -hmm. I like I was very early to a lot of social media platforms and I like yeah I definitely I've definitely been interested in tech for a long time and particularly just like the internet itself like the internet as a, a tool for communication and for branding and seeing like the potential the internet has to really connect people whereas you know prior to it that kind of potential was was a lot more limited especially on a global level and yeah I I like spent a little bit of time learning Python, but it wasn't mm -hmm. something that I found like I was passionate about and I never really stuck with it. But for this project in particular, I actually just went onto freelancer.com and I talked to a handful of different coders and I eventually found a full stack developer who I just really clicked with. And mm -hmm. he's someone who had never worked on any music industry related projects. He didn't know anything about the music industry in fact, but he kind of, I like explained to him like, how playlisting worked and mm -hmm. um, some of my experience and what my goals were and what I did as a manager. And I kind of told him like, you know, there's a, there's a serious lack of automation in, in this industry in particular. And mm -hmm. if that's something you're interested in, we could apply this here and potentially in other ways. And yeah, I, we ended up like, you know, we created this tool and I definitely got lucky because I think a lot of times people, you know, finding people on the web, like it's, it's random and, you know, right. you know, always get that person, but, I found someone that I really I'm I'm planning on working with for the rest of my career. He's become like an essential part of my team. And, you know, we worked on this tool, but we're working on other tools. And yeah, like I said, like a second ago, like kind of automation and applying technology to the wider music industry is something that's that hasn't been done. It's an industry that's almost a little bit behind when it comes to tech. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And a lot of times when, when you're starting a business, right, it's usually because you see some kind of a problem in, in the market and you're trying to find build the solution to that problem. Was it you as an artist manager that found a problem with, with Spotify and you now created a solution? Like what was the problem that you saw? Yeah, you're super spot on, like super on point. Like I basically, the, there was a gap and I like, I had tried all the online services and the management teams I was working with had tried a bunch of third party agencies. And, you know, the, the playlisting game is a lot of smoke and mirrors. And I've worked with I work with some clients that are that have big followings and you know they we know people at the editorial teams because the artists have bridged that gap and you know that's one outlet but for the majority of acts and especially developing acts playlisting is kind of like a real uphill battle and mm -hmm. a lot of the services I was working with and third party agencies were like they were, they were charging a lot more than the results were worth mm -hmm. and what I ended up doing a lot just between my team and the people I work with was going onto Spotify and doing the manual work of digging through playlists, doing searches for keywords and for genres and similar artists and looking for looking for playlists and then going into the playlist, looking at the description and just checking if they had like a contact info available and kind of doing like a grassroots manual approach to finding it. And yeah, that's something that, you know, my, I would have like an assistant who would spend like hours doing this kind of work and like, you know, I talked to other managers and even indie artists that I was talking to, and it wasn't, we weren't the only ones doing this. A lot of people who were kind of fed up with the pay to play, like mm -hmm. services that couldn't guarantee you results were like, I'm just going to try and find contact info myself. And th it's super time consuming because you're literally clicking around a music listening app, trying to use it as like a networking app. Mm -hmm. And so it's not intended to be used that way. And yeah, that's kind of like, I kind of explained that to the coder. And I was like, can we automate this process? Is it possible that we could kind of grab the contact info from these descriptions and mass? And yeah, that's that was how the whole thing got started. What were the services that you were using? I'm just, the, the, where mind is jump, my mind is jumping to is playlist pluggers. Is that what you were using? Like people that just like, I guess, charge you a fee and then they promise you to get you on a certain amount of playlists? Exactly. It was it like, I, I don't know if it was that one in particular. It's been a while since I've used them just because like, 
I was using this app myself on my computer for a long time before I made it available to other people. And so mm -hmm. I've kind of been using my own software and like this, I, even before that we were using this manual approach, but yeah, it was basically services where you pay them to do the, to basically do the same work. You pay them to have, to, to reach out to their network of playlists, which they probably got by just going on Spotify and looking at right. descriptions and, and, you know, they take a significant amount of money off the top to pay them and their team. And then they use the rest of your money as a budget to potentially pay some playlists or to get out, to get it out there, use whatever software they use. And yeah, it was, it, it was kind of just like you pay them to do the work. And yeah, with, I, I decided to kind of like start doing the work myself and, and stop trying to like just outsource everything. And yeah. What are some, some common mistakes that you see artists make when it comes to Spotify? I think that, I think, some common mistakes would be, you know, I kind of just like putting music out there and mm -hmm. just expecting it to like be successful on its own. Obviously good music, you know, good music hits. Right. And like, if you have a hit on your hands, you're going to put it out and some one person will hear it and they're going to show two people. And then those right. two people are going to show four people. And sure. there's, there's definitely, there's definitely like the almost anomaly and like the, the natural effect of a really good song, just kind of, being a drop in a pond and spreading outward but mm -hmm. there's very it's very easy to kind of set up a small indie marketing campaign and it's it's not difficult to like to like put together a plan and what i what i see a lot of artists do is kind of just like they've got the they've got the song done and they set a release date and they just put it out and you know it, it doesn't take a ton of work to be like okay i'm gonna take two weeks before and i'm gonna take two weeks after and this is what i'm gonna do and even if it's stuff that doesn't cost any money even if it's like you know, Monday through Friday before release, I'm gonna text 10 different people the link to the, the link to the, the pre-save. And I'm gonna post it once on each social media every other day leading up to it. And kind of just like having, having a plan that kind of does the music justice. Cause if it's, you know, having the good music is part of it, but the other right. part is like getting it out there. And a lot of yeah. artists, they, they focus on one and I, you know, a lot of them are creatives and it's not, it's not easy to, to balance both, but it's also like, people people know through using Instagram and there's a lot of platforms that have made kind of like branding yourself and marketing yourself right. and uh, the regularity of posting things. They've made it kind of normal. And so, you know, putting in the time to like make sure that it doesn't just, not, it doesn't drop and just not get heard. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, when you have a good song, right? Good song is a good song and people will naturally just share it if it's a good song. You still have yeah. to do some things to reach a wider audience and you still have to put in money into promotion, but what, what I love about what you said is when, because you're, when you're an artist or you're managing the artist, you can be really biased because you want to love everything you do or you want to love everything your artist does. So what I always tell people when, when your friends are actually sharing your music or your friends or family or your small circle of um, trust, if they share your music or ask you for permission to share your music, that's how you know if it's a good song, right? If they just say, oh, that's so cool. I'm glad you did that. Like, that's kind of like, all right, it's good. I'm, you're my friend. I'm going to give you positive feedback. But the way you really know it's good when people start sharing it. A hundred percent. And I think like there's there's all kinds of people who are like, they're trying to get their pulse on how that viral song works and like mm -hmm. how that you get those those artists who drop something and it just goes crazy on TikTok or it right. goes crazy on Instagram or, you know, all of a sudden, like every a and every label is following them. And you're like, OK, this person's about to get signed. This person's right. going up. Um, it's like, yeah, it's and I don't think there is any one formula. Like mm -hmm. there's people that try to crack that formula. But the truth is, there's no single formula to going viral or to getting like that that song that's like a hit. And it, it's definitely a combination of things. And I think the one thing that's common between all of them is like there's always like some some like grassroots like steam behind it. And, you know, people, when people, when people find something great, they want to share it, just like right. you said. And it's like, it's like, it, it just, you see sometimes these, these artists will like post a song on TikTok or, and even if there was no marketing budget behind it, because it was so catchy or because the, the it was just so well done or the video fit the song and people just, just share it naturally. It's like when you're scrolling on Instagram and you cross a meme that you love, you send it to your five friends, like Absolutely. it just happens. Um, and so like, I think, I think that's something that as much as you try to like pay someone or get a marketing agency or you get to get a team to kind of make that happen, there's a significant part of that that's organic. And that's also why a lot of artists 
who might have that moment, they can't always replicate it. Like their second right. song, it might not have the same thing. And yeah, there's, I've, I've seen, um, I've seen, I've seen some attempts and there, there are ways to kind of, kind of be subtle and do guerrilla marketing and, um, you know, something that comes to mind and this is a random example, but like there was, um, there was a viral picture um, a while back of Justin Bieber eating a burrito sideways. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if you're, you're familiar, but this like this this picture like like it was from a there was like a small like i think it was like a comedy youtube channel or mm -hmm. something similar and this picture just went viral and like i don't think it was i, I it, it seemed like it was staged but it wasn't like staged by his marketing team but if you think about it something like that could very well be planned yeah. and so you know if, if you do think outside the box and you kind of have a gorilla idea there are ways to kind of and, and get that organic thing going on its own but more often than not it just happens and some of these mm -hmm. people wake up the next day and their song a million people sent it to a million other friends and they're on right. the top spotify chart yeah yeah it's a nice thing to wake up to <laughs> yeah and another mistake i see artists make a lot on on spotify and which is something that spotify really started cracking down on is the the artificial or the fake streams um and i yeah. think you've, you've spoken about that too like why why is it a bad idea to go on Fiverr or some random website and pay someone 20 bucks to get you a few thousand streams. Why is, why is that such a risk? Yeah. Like, I think. Well, I mean the, like the, like you were speaking on, like the most obvious risk now is that, you know, when you have a company like Spotify that has a, a partial ownership of a company like DistroKid, there's like, you know, there's, there's, they, they, they're working with distributors, even if it's not DistroKid, there's other distributors they're working with. And so like, there's, there's the money incentive of the distributors to have it taken down because if a song gets taken down, then, you know, or the, the streams are fake, that's revenue that they save. And so, you know, um, there's that element and that's a definitely more recent element. I think a lot of people are kind of, were kind of shocked at by how many songs got taken down. And mm -hmm. yeah, like just from my experience working with larger clients, like, Every single record label does, does they, they all have someone, one of their acts at least who has fake streams and right. they, they, it was some marketing person along the line who, like you said, they paid someone who might have a bot network or who knows someone who knows someone. And yeah, the, another big example I think was, um, last year was Takashi and, you know, you were just looking at his YouTube numbers and some of his streaming numbers on some of his last releases. And it just, it just literally didn't make sense. It was like, it was obviously inflated. And there's the, there's the incentive on that, on, on the, the side with, of Spotify with the big artists is they want more traffic to their platform. And so an mm -hmm. artist that looks like something is, is super viral and they have a billion like streams, it, it makes other people want to listen to it. Sure. And, you know, I think the kind of, the kind of basics that, that make that flawed are, there's algorithmic problems. Like if you pay for streams and then your next release doesn't match up to it or all the streams come from like a shady place, you can mess up your, your Spotify algorithm and then Absolutely. you're not going to get recommended to the right fans and you're not mm -hmm. going to get put into the, the right um, like weekly playlists. And you're, it, it definitely messes up the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And once you mess up the algorithm, there's not a lot of ways to repair that. You can't like hit up Spotify and be like, hey, I bought a bunch of plays. Can you refresh my algorithm? That right. doesn't happen. Right. And so, you know, you can kind of be shooting yourself in the foot, especially as an indie artist from the get go, like, you know, say you've been paying for plays for your first few releases, and then you have that hit song, if your algorithm isn't isn't right, then you know, that hit song might not get to the people that it would have gotten to otherwise. Right. Um, and so yeah, that's I think that's like a more fundamental issue with it. Um, and, and, and the other even the other even more fundamental issue with it is, you know, your, your goal should be building like really hardcore like evangelical fans mm -hmm. and paying paying for plays like you you might get listens and you know it might result in maybe like even if you're paying like for like ads you're gonna get more people listening to it and that might be your goal but you want all of that stuff to be supplemental to like building actual fans that are gonna come back that are gonna do like we said before like share the music and you know to do that it requires a lot more than just like throwing money into the ether mm -hmm. so true we have a lot of music business students that you know, want to be managers, producers, or musicians that listen to the podcast. So I'm so glad you talked about that and mentioned that. And I just want to add to, for, for the listeners, um, you know, like buying these fake streams, you're better off spending that 20 bucks on, on your first month of playlist supply and then see the value in that and keep spending that 20 bucks uh, in that. And you, you have to do the work. There, there is no easy way out. And as, as Benji said, like you really, 
just destroy your algorithm because what what's really important is similar artists right when you click on similar artists on spotify you want those artists to be relevant to to you or your music and it could take months or years to repair the damage of buying fake plays um a quick little story i mentioned this before on a podcast but not everyone listens to every episode and um because i think this is very relevant to this topic but when i first started a podcast this is five years ago now i bought fake streams um for a podcast just to get the numbers up because i learned that's what a lot of book um publishers do as well they'll buy a bunch of books to get on a new york times bestseller so it's like oh so if they do it i should do it too it's five years later if you look at similar podcasts to this podcast it's a investment podcast mma weird news personal development technology book reviews and like one podcast out of 22 is directly related which is tales from the road but you know years later i'm still trying to fix the damage i've done from buying these fake streams on on fiverr so do not do it it's really gonna mess up just everything and yeah when as benji said once you do uh put out that big hit that's a real hit it's it's not gonna go well it's gonna go flat because you don't have the, the ai of spotify is not recognizing your song with the right similar songs yeah no you're spot on and i i like what you said about um hearing what book that book publishers do it and other publishers do it because it's honestly it's it can be very misleading sometimes like you know so for some of these larger acts that have major record deals like um like i talked about like takashi and and there's like there's lots of other artists like mm. some of your favorite artists might be paying for fake streams and yeah. a lot of these labels they're kind of hedging their bets and it's kind of a vested interest and in they if the if your artist already gets a million streams boosting it by by a few hundred thousand you know it's it's not going to completely ruin their algorithm because it's going to get lost in the other numbers and they kind yeah. of have a different methodology but it's it's kind of unfortunate but a lot of them they they do the exact same thing and it can be a lot it can be misleading to a lot of like young artists and like indie artists thinking like you know they need to do a million overnight or like they need to like they need to get the numbers up and i know a and r's who like you know i know i have i know tons of a and r's i know i know like most a and r's like <laughs> in la and like these people a lot of times you know there's the, the kind of the kind of old school a and r mentality of digging for that artist on soundcloud or on youtube mm -hmm. or finding someone that no one's on it's it's not as relevant as a lot of these artists they'll like find someone and they go straight to spotify and they check right. the numbers and there's a lot less risk taken because there's so much importance on the numbers and mm -hmm. i think with the with the way botting works and with the way fake streams work that's it's such a it's such a poor practice and you, I think a lot of people are realizing it, especially with the with the more recent events of stuff getting taken down and how much more transparency is coming out. And I think we're going to see a return to kind of that old school a and instinct. And, you know, you could have 10 listens, but if your song speaks to someone and that person has the right connections, they're going to they're going to send it to the right person, right. regardless of the numbers. Right. And, you know, you, you could get a crazy development deal and not have any numbers and not have had to pay for one fake stream. And yeah, so I, I like, I also would advise not to be misled by the fact that a lot of these record labels with massive budgets, you know, they can, they, they can afford to, and they do, they do put fake numbers on the board. Right. And it's like, do, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of just like a part of the game. Like they're, they're like, yeah, it's, and it's unfortunate, but yeah, it's, you know, like I said, Spotify with some of these massive artists, like, they're not going to take down uh like they're not going to take down a massive artist song because they want that traffic to the platform and right. so they're incentivized too and so it's really unfortunate because not only like like indie artists and smaller artists kind of get screwed twice over like they don't have the they don't have the like the incentive isn't really there like for spotify to keep their music up if they're doing the fake streams and then if they do it and they and they it doesn't get taken down it messes up their algorithm and mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a it's it might be one of the toughest times to be an indie artist and putting out music right now especially with the pandemic and all of mm -hmm. that included but just with the with the digital environment and the way streaming is it's it's definitely a, it's definitely an uphill battle yeah absolutely and and you know going back to like indie artists they just have to do the work cuz a major label if they're buying the fake strings, strings, it might be one to five percent of their budget. If an indie artist does it, it's fifty to hundred percent of their budget, right? So exactly. If you're working with such smaller numbers, and that's why the major labels can get get away with that. So don't don't get caught up in that game. Um, before we dive into like playlist supply and how it works, what are the different types of playlists on Spotify? So the ones that there's there's two kinds when I when I hear that question that come to mind, and that's the mm -hmm. editorial playlist, which are the ones that are run by Spotify. 
and those are more or less inaccessible. Um, you're not gonna you're not gonna email someone and get on that. Um, it's like it's not gonna be something where you can just work hard and and like get to the right person. There's you submit to that through the Spotify for artists platform, and if you don't do that, like you might have someone who you know who's like a manager or who works at your label or someone who's connected to the editorial team. And they might they might try to like you know put in a good word or call their friend at the editorial team, but for most people you just kind of toss that into the ether with Spotify for artists. Right. And the other type of playlists are uh, just public user playlists, and mm -hmm. those are the ones that Playlist Supply focuses on. And there's actually when you use Playlist Supply, you can sort by different criteria. And if you sort just by general playlists, like if you if nothing is the criteria, you're gonna get editorial playlists that come up as well. They just won't have contact info available. But the main the main goal of it is to focus on user generated playlists and find that that one person who's like, you know, they're the popular like music listener in their circle, and they're the one that like kind of sets the trend amongst their friends. And they have a playlist, and they have a bunch of people who follow it. And yeah, getting into that is like is a way to kind of get into a new little fan group. Mm -hmm, absolutely. How much emphasis do you put on, on the metadata of a song and like, what are some, some important things for artists to know to include in the metadata so your, their songs are found the correct way? Um, I, would, I would always say like, you know, with the metadata, you wanna push it to the limit. Like, mm -hmm. um, like just as an example, like I see a lot of artists when they upload, like say I, I've just started working with an act and I wanna check out the back end of their YouTube. I'll go and I'll look at like their most recent release and I'll look at the tags that they put. Mm -hmm. And you know, they might put five tags that they thought were relevant, but the limit that, they, that YouTube gives you is like, you know, up to 50 tags or like mm -hmm. 500 characters, always push it to the limit. There's always gonna be like one more hashtag or one more similar artist. And when it comes to metadata, you wanna give it like, you wanna cast a wide net. And like, mm -hmm. it's, I, I see a lot of people kind of like, not kind of like doing the, the little bit of extra work and putting in the extra few minutes to like, you know, think what are, what are some extra keywords? What are some extra, you can even think of activities. Like you can even mm -hmm. think what would someone do while listening to my song and just right. make sure it's as extensive as possible so that there's more of a chance of people stumbling on the song. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so true. And what what is Playlist Supply? I guess go, go a little bit into what what the company is and how how it all works, how the platform works. Yeah, so uh, Playlist Supply is basically uh, it's a it's a software tool, and it's kind of like Google, but exclusively for playlists on Spotify. And it's it's like a search engine for playlists and their contact info. And you know, like you like we were speaking on like fake streams and stuff earlier there's there is still yet like i know there used to be a tool built into chart metric and there's another one called is it a good playlist but like i said spotify has kind of incentives uh to keep the bot stuff going because a lot of big labels use it and mm -hmm. you know there's 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 a whole bunch of reasons why and like those people who are getting paid like will keep using it and there there isn't a great way to filter out playlists that might have fake streams but it's again it's doing the work and it's recognizing the nuance and Playlist Supply, it basically makes that process a, a whole lot easier and a whole lot faster. Whereas normally you might go on to, to look up playlists and you could spend like 10 hours doing it and you might build a list of a hundred playlists, just mm -hmm. clicking and scrolling. What this does is you basically type in a keyword or you type in an artist name or you, you could type in anything. And it goes through and it scrapes all of the contact info of playlists that are related to whatever you searched. And so, you could spend like a minute thinking of a search and you run the search and then you get like a spreadsheet of a thousand playlists or 2000 playlists. And you can spend more time focusing on the outreach and you can spend more time focusing on, you know, individually looking at each playlist and thinking, okay, does this one look legit? Does this one look like it has a bunch of songs that are like recently added and like they might just be running kind of like, you know, like a, like a playlisting kind of scheme here. Or is this one that has like, 10 artists that fit my genre perfectly. And, you know, it also has a couple hits that I know from by heart. Is this playlist super organic? And instead of spending the time just looking for the contact info, you can spend more time doing outreach and actually getting into playlists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such, that's such a great resource. I, they're, they're, Corey the Savior, who, who's from uh, Brandman Network, he's been on, on the podcast. He's done a really cool video on Playlist Supply. So I, I definitely I can't wait to try it out with some of the artists I work. And it's a really cool platform. And when you do these searches, right, it's basically like a spreadsheet that, that you yeah. get out of it, as you mentioned. What type of information is on these spreadsheets? So on the spreadsheet, 
you're given the name of the playlist, you're given the follower count of the playlist, you're given the description of the playlist. And then it has two kind of other, the most important ones are there's an email tab, which will show you the email of the playlist. And there's a social tab, which will show you if there's a Twitter handle or an Instagram handle associated, it'll give you the Instagram handle or the social media contact. And that's really cool because, you know, if you want to be an indie artist, that's like doing your own management and marketing work, you can kind of take a more organic approach and reach out to them on social media. And, you know, sometimes emailing can be very like, it's very like PR, like it's mm-hmm. very much like you're doing a pitch. And, you know, yeah, exactly. If, if you have like a cool Instagram, you know, they're going to weigh that into the equation when they think about including your music. And so shooting them a DM or shooting them a Twitter DM, like it could, it could be in like a more sociable, like a more kind of organic approach. And yeah, those are the two other uh, columns that it provides. And um, we're actually adding a new column in the next couple of weeks. And I haven't, I haven't talked to anyone about this, but this is like a brand new feature we're adding. Um, but we're adding a, a feature that's going to show you the like the the most recently added song to the playlist and the mm. the the like the oldest song added to the playlist oh, cool. and that's going to be something that helps people kind of like decipher if it's a good playlist or not if it's someone that actively updates and adds new songs or if it's someone that made like their favorite drake songs from 2010 and has never changed the playlist since and so right. yeah those are two more data points that we're going to be adding there's also a data point that's kind of a less relevant one um it tells you if the playlist is public or not And a lot of times people like make playlists and they're just for themselves and they're private playlists. And other times people make playlists that are public and they're meant for like people who follow their blog or, and yeah. And so that, that one shows you if the playlist is public or not. And our, our tool only grabs publicly available data. So the majority of the results are public, but every once in a while, there'll be one that will fall into there where someone like had it public, but changed it private. And then it, it shows in there that it's no longer public. Okay. A lot of cool, a lot of great information that you get from, from these searches. It's awesome. And what, when you're searching by keywords, right? Let's say you're, you're a hip hop artist and you're trying to find playlists that are similar to you. Like what kind of keywords do you recommend they, they use in their search or in their research trying to find these different playlists? Yeah, no, that's a super good question. I, I recommend people get really creative, the more outside the box. And it's kind of like with the metadata, like you know, you can try generic searches and you could try just typing in the name of your genre or like the name of the biggest band that like people say you sound like. But I, I definitely recommend getting like thinking of more niche keywords. And like if you know your music is popular with like a certain like demographic or a certain location or a certain like, you know, try and find all those data points that are, are, are most relevant to you. And other than that, I would say similar artists is like the best way to, to kind of target and that it's, it's a good practice for anyone trying to figure out like how to brand themselves and market themselves is literally just like, listen to, listen to your most recent two or three releases and, you know, go and ask a few of your biggest fans, who do we sound like? If you had to compare us to one band, who would it be? And ask yourself that and build out a list of 20, 30 artists that are similar to you, that have the same sound, that have the same vibe. Maybe they just have the same aesthetic and the music isn't super similar and then find playlists that those people are already in and that people have already seen them like as, as a good fit. And chances are that they might recognize the, the crossover and they might see like, okay, I see the similarity. And yeah, you can even mention that when you're pitching, like, hey, like I saw you had a bunch of Oasis songs. Um, my new band really sounds like Oasis and we try to replicate that old school vibe from o- Oasis's original releases. And, you know, th- that that kind of kind of, like recognizing what the the artists who have come before you who have kind of set the ground for you have done and like finding those names and studying what they do and yeah like there's you know if you find that I feel like that would that could be a good example because with something like Oasis you could look up live performances and you could look up there's like a whole there's like a whole history that you could you could kind of decipher and find okay what keywords were they big in what location were they big in and the tool scrapes all of Spotify so you're going to get playlists from all over the world. And I also, you know, you could search in different languages and mm. yeah, it's, it really comes down to being creative. And I think um, those are like, that's my advice for like suggestions, but mm-hmm. ultimately it's, it's, you know, the, the key is really to do a lot of searches. Like don't sure. go and just type in uh, pop or hip hop. You're going to get, you're going to get generic results. Do that for sure, but also search 20 other things. Mm-hmm. And then, and then like, there's an option to export all of your results to a spreadsheet 
export each result to a spreadsheet and combine it into one big spreadsheet and then start going through and filtering and saying, okay, which of these is it? Should I just delete off the top? Are they too right. generic? Um, and yeah, just, you know, casting a wide net. It, it, it does come down to the numbers sometimes, like in terms of outreach. Mm-hmm. And, and like, that's a good tip, like putting it all into one spreadsheet. Cause then if you put it all into one like master sheet, you could sort yeah. by playlist name and see which playlist shows up the most often. And maybe those are good playlists to target as well. Um, exactly. Now, it, uh, Spotify recently filed a, a patent to where they now can find your, uh, or I guess show you or recommend music based on your mood, which is <laughs> really creepy. Um, yeah. Does, does your platform only use uh, or search by keywords that are people using in actual like playlist description and the artists that they're using? Or will it, um, I guess, search after some of those things that the Facebook, I mean, this Facebook, the Spotify AI uses too? Like, like could you type in a mood and we'll f- find playlists that fit a certain mood? Yeah, so you currently can. You can type in, um, like, you could type in happy or sad. And right now, it's not using that data point, that play, that Spotify embeds in the in the song. Excuse me. Um, but they, but they definitely... Like they def- you know, people include keywords about mood in the description and they include it in the title. And yeah, our, our tool doesn't use the API. It only uses publicly available information. And like I said, um, we're recently planning on adding the, the latest added song and the oldest song in the playlist. There's other publicly available information that we've recently kind of discovered is available in, in, the, in Spotify songs. And it seems like they've been including this kind of mood, uh, this mood data for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if they have some sort of AI or if they have a person when you submit it that that categorizes it, or even when you upload, you might be able to choose like some some like where the genre is, and they just kind of assume. But like um, every every song on Spotify comes with some data in the metadata that says like this is energetic, like this right. is sad, right. and so yeah, we currently. You can search for that on Playlist Supply. It doesn't use that exact data point, but it's definitely something I'm I would plan on doing in the future, and I would like to implement. I yeah, I I definitely I definitely think yeah, it's a little bit weird that they're doing that, but I don't know if it's based on like literally your mood as much as it's based on like maybe the chord progression of the song and like right. kind of the vibe of the song. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's 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 definitely like a super interesting data point and. The reason I kind of we we didn't focus on that initially is because when I when I first checked it out, I couldn't imagine it being too accurate. Like I couldn't imagine like you know it, it could be a metal song, and because it's got because of the intensity of the of the of the recording, they might categorize it as happy. But that song's right. probably <laughs> not very happy. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I, I I figured like I'd rather it be kind of like someone who says in the description like this is a playlist for like summer vibes and a happy like beach time, like being the more accurate result. And then like whatever Spotify's AI categorizes that. But I, yeah, that's definitely something to, to double back on. And I, I do plan on looking at that data point more. An interesting thought I had, so to talk about moods, right? When it comes to the sync licensing, a lot of these um, companies, like these brands, they're looking for certain moods for songs. And since you can like literally search any kind of playlist, if, if I have a playlist with no followers, like I have, a playlist literally on my Spotify of songs that get synced just so I get an idea of what types of songs are sync friendly. So you can probably yeah. search um, just the word sync or music supervision in your, in your platform and find a bunch of playlists. Um, yeah. Based around that. A thousand percent. And that's a great, that's like a great point. You could, you could search for those keywords and you could find, you can even like, there's probably a whole language of music of like video production and like the people who do the, the sync placements and, you could search all of that and you could even find the names of those companies and maybe even hunt down their playlists. And mm. yeah, it's, it's like, it's a super powerful research tool. And I think like that's, that's, I haven't heard that specific kind of like cross like search idea, but that's a really, really good one. And, you know, imagine you could reach out to 10 or 20 playlists of people who are like music directors and then, you know, yeah. you get your song placed in a movie or a TV show yeah. and, yeah, that's that's a that's a really good that's a really really good idea. I'm gonna start mentioning that to more people. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a random thought I had. But but speaking of reaching speaking of reaching out to people, so it seems like most of the playlist curators prefer to be reached out directly by the artist through through Twitter or Instagram versus a formal email. If you're a manager and you're trying to help your artist, um, is it better just to use the artist account and like almost reach out as quote unquote the artist, even though you're the manager reaching out using their account? 
Yeah, yeah. I recommend that to a lot of people. You know, I think it's good to try both. Like mm -hmm. there's some really cool um, email automation software like MailChimp and GMAS. And I, I personally use like, a, I use those. And, you know, it's good to kind of like do both. But if you, if, even if you're the manager using your artist's social media integrity and kind of like the, the value of their brand to kind of like bridge that gap, like, you know, if you have a blue check and you reach out to someone who owns a playlist, they might be really willing to hit you back and they're right. going to see that message right away and they're going to get excited. And, you know, if you did good research and you found playlists that are really relevant to your artist and you have a, a your client is like, is like significant, then they might be like already a fan. And then right. all of a sudden they're having like a fan moment and they're like, wow, mm -hmm. like this person's hitting me up. I feel so privileged to talk to them even. And they're going to be super willing to help you out. And so, yeah, I definitely recommend not just sending a bunch of emails, but if you can use your Instagram, use your Twitter and like reach out to people that way. And, and, you know, it's also a good way to kind of, to kind of see what they're about. Like you could see what their profile looks like. Right. You could see like, okay, is this really just like a person who loves music or is this someone who's turned their playlist into a business? And I'm just going to get like, you know, I'm, I might not get like the best, the best plays out of it. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a, I definitely often suggest people like, try go the try go a more organic route and be more sociable and just shoot them a dm like it's it's easy mm -hmm. and did you create this platform to, to solve a problem that that you've had right your artists and trying to reach these playlist curators i'm assuming you've probably reached out to hundreds if not thousands of them do you have yes. any tips for best practices on reaching out so if you reach out through a dm um do you make it personal a little bit so like based on what they're posting on their timeline to make like a personal connection? Like what, what are some strategies on how to reach out and how long should that, that pitch be? Yeah, no, absolutely. I have like a whole bunch of best practices and, you know, I think like any pitch, like you don't want it to be too long, but mm -hmm. you want it to be enough to kind of start to get them invested in, in like your music and your story. And, you know, you tell them a little bit about yourself, tell them a little bit about the release. And, you know, also like, I think, I think, if, if you're just doing outreach, you know, like what, what you, they have something that you want and, you know, show them how that's important to you by maybe listening to their playlist and tell right. them like, I listened to your playlist. I really like the intro, like those first two songs, like you have a great taste. Like I also have like a song I want to put in the playlist and I think it would be a great fit. And mm -hmm. just like little things like that, like definitely should be more sociable. Definitely like it's reach out to a lot. Like it's definitely mm -hmm. a numbers game in terms of outreach, like with yeah. just like with press, like if you reach out to a thousand playlists, you're going to get more people biting than if you reach out to a hundred mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, taking that extra time to maybe screen the playlists and vet them a little bit can help you like make that connection. Like you can tell them you liked it and why you liked it. Um, and yeah, you can, if you, if you're willing to do the time and do the social media stuff, you can find out other stuff about them and like, you can really make it like uh, you you want people to invest in in your music just like you're invested you don't want them to see it as like okay i'm gonna add this song for a week and then i'm gonna take it out or like i'm gonna add this song because they're asking me to and like that's it like you know there's i've i've even seen people do like social media trades like you can kind of be like all right i'm gonna help your i'm down to help you grow your playlist if you help me grow my music and i'm down to promote your playlist on instagram stories and on twitter dms and you can even build a relationship with them. Like that's another really good practice that I recommend is don't keep it to just one release. Like if you if you can share with them like a, a private SoundCloud link or a private Dropbox of like a snippet of your next release or even a, a snippet of like the music that you're about to share, like give them that, like let them know that like you're willing to bring them in a little bit in order to like make that, make that exchange. Like you know, you don't want to just be kind of like reaching out to people, expecting them to help you for nothing. Like you want to try to get them to invest too. And, and most of these playlist curators, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into building a playlist with enough followers to where, let's say, which we'll get into a little bit too, but um, you now some of these playlists do charge money to be on the playlist. Um, yes. There is, there is some work that goes into that to get to a point where you can charge money. So most of these curators i would assume at least 90 to 99 percent of them are probably music fans so is there anything that that an artist can do in between releases in keeping engaged with these curators just to build a, a stronger relationship so when that next release comes it's almost a no-brainer of course we're gonna release this music because we're, we're friends now so so the question is is, is there anything else that artists yeah can do absolutely the, i like i said before go, go ahead sorry 
sorry. Oh no, it, it was lagging a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, sorry, what were you saying? So, so is there anything artists can do in between releases uh, to keep that building that relationship with these curators? Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Uh, I, it might, I don't know if it's my connection, but anyways, yeah. Um, you know, sharing with them like unreleased music, you know, the same things you would want to give your fans to keep them in engaged. You're going to want to give the playlist people. Like if you have like a garage band session and you guys are just jamming, grab a snippet and share it with them. Yeah. Um, you want to, you want to just find ways to like, let them know that like they're, they're more than just like a, 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 a like a bouncing point for your music. Like there's someone that could be the super van that helps put them on the map. And mm -hmm. you want to like make that apparent to them by like showing them like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you in. You're going to be part of the team. Like it's yeah. not, you're not just someone that I'm going to reach out to when I need you. Um, I'm like willing to give you some like behind the scenes and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Just like making sure they're in the loop. Yeah. Um, sharing with them, like what your strategy is long-term. Like if you're, if you're planning on, on like, if you're planning on multiple releases, you, you likely have like a, a strategy for multiple months and, you, you probably have goals of where you want your music and your career to be in a year. And you, you should share that with them and like, let them know, like, this is where I'm trying to get to. And, you know, so that they can see the big picture and they don't see it mm -hmm. as just one release. And yeah, like, um, you know, I don't condone pay to play. It's definitely true. There's a lot of like playlists that charge money. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the services that exist, they just go to playlists that they know charge money and they, they take part of your money and they put like, they pocket part of it for the work and then they pay right. the playlist to put it in. And, you know, Spotify also doesn't contone pay to play. Like there's like a lot of, there's a lot of like people who, you know, th they've kind of turned the playlisting thing into just like a quick Venmo or like a quick right. way to get some money. And, you know, I've, I'm not going to say like I have or haven't done it, but there's a significant amount of playlists that are doing that. And there's also playlists where like, like you said, like they've put in the work and they might be running ads for their playlist and they mm -hmm. like, they might not necessarily be just fake followers. Like this might be someone that really wants to use their playlist as a platform to grow other artists. And like, in order to figure that out, I would, I would really spend time talking to them. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you just, if you just send them the money and you send them one email, chances are like, you know, they, they could run off with your money per se. Like there's, <laughs> there's no guarantees really. Like you want to talk to this person. You want to ask them like, okay, like maybe what are the average streams? Like, you know, is there any way, like, is there like, what, what is something else I can do? Like, can I help you grow the playlist? Like we said before, like, can we share like to social media? And, you know, there's also a, there's also like, there's also like a handful of playlist people who like, I, there's, there's a couple playlists, particularly in hip hop, which is like the genre I work in mostly that, you know, there's some really big indie playlists and these people don't take money. It's against mm -hmm. like their, their brand value and it's oh. against what they believe ethically. Awesome. And they just like, they're just like, you know, they might be some trust fund kids or something, but they have playlists that are as big as the editorials and they're just looking for good music. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a total mixed bag and you have to go into it like prepared for like, you know, uh, some people might want money. Some people might not. Some people might just want an Instagram shout out. And some people might just want to find like the next band that's going to yeah. pop off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, some of them just want to be influencers themselves in the music space. Like they just want to exactly. build their own personal brands. Yeah. What, what, so let's say you were to pay someone and you have that conversation, you vetted them out. Um, not, not, not saying that you've done it right, but um, yeah. let's, say, let's say you were to do it. Is there any kind of suggestions you, you have on how to figure out what is a good price? Like for, for example, in commercials for podcasts, right? It's usually based on per thousand streams. So it's like 10 to $20 per thousand streams. So if you're getting you know, 10,000 streams and say it's 10 bucks, it's a hundred dollars for, to do a commercial in that podcast. Do you have a, yeah. is there a similar system or format that you would suggest for, for this? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, there's no standard. It's a total mixed bag. Like you, you'll, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. Like I've even reached out to some playlists that look totally organic. The mm -hmm. owner's name is like something like you would think is like the owner's name is like Joe and like you reach out to the playlist and it turns out this like there was one there was there's a few that this has happened to where I, I found that person and I actually reached out to them personally on social media and it turned out that like like um, Universal or Warner had purchased the account their Spotify account oh, years wow. ago and mm -hmm. a record label owns their playlist and their name is still associated with it but they just signed away the rights and like you know, before, like, I, like, I just want to like, let people know too, that 
it's not just like indie artists who are doing this, like who might make a small payment and go against the user agreement to get ahead. The record labels are doing the exact same okay. thing and they're doing it with way bigger budgets than you have. And so like, I don't be discouraged. Like if, if, you know, if like, if you want to like spend a little bit, it's, it's there's, it, and, and like, like your question spoke to, there are ways to do it correctly. Like there's no standard. So there's no like average amount that you should spend. You could, everything's negotiable in, in this right. kind of sense. And yeah, I ask for full transparency, like ask them to send you screenshots of uh, like a lot of these playlisters that are charging money because they've made it into a business. They have like, they probably have, sorry, there's a plane passing over. I'll talk um, a lot of these playlisters probably have screenshots of previous campaigns and they probably have artists who have shared with them, okay, this is how many streams I got in a month and ask for all of that. Ask like, how many streams can I expect? What's your monthly average? Where do they come from? What mm -hmm. cities? And try and get as much technical detail as possible and use that to kind of gauge like, okay, is this like, is this someone that's like, you know, running a ton of ads for their playlist? And it's going to be like, they're not going to be fake streams, but it's going to be really broad and it's not going to be really targeted. Um, it may be, is this worth like, a, a, like more money or less money? Or is this someone who's like, you know, this is someone who's just like the, a college kid who has like a playlist that the Spotify algorithm took off and they get like super high engagement and it's all from the same city and my music's in that city maybe this is worth it for me to spend a little extra or not and so yeah that's like i definitely think it's like up to the use it's up to the user and the artist discretion and to do the work to vet them out and like and like if you build a relationship with this playlister or you at least attempt to they're going to be more honest about like why it's worth that and you know you it's, it could even be as simple as asking them like you know what am i paying for like is it just to be inside the playlist and hope for the best? Or do right. you know anything about the details of your playlist? Yep, very good. Um, so sorry for, for the sake of time, um, I'm, I'm, for the listeners, search um, Greenlight Countries for Facebook ads or Facebook marketing Greenlight Countries. Because one big thing you, you've mentioned is um, asking where the streams come from, right? And as long as they come from the Greenlight Countries, I, I would say it's a go, like go try to work with that playlist. But if they're coming from places like India, China, Brazil, not there's anything wrong with those countries, but the, the chances of bots and click farms and fake streams is a lot higher from, from those types of countries. So listeners like search green light countries for, for marketing um, and definitely ask that question. But um, another thing I was gonna ask you, uh, first time user of, of Playlist Supply, like if they're first time and they're newer, what um, recommendation do you have in terms of like which playlist to reach out to because it's going to be very enticing to like reach out to the playlist with the most followers is but is it something where you maybe build small and get one that has 100 followers get on that playlist first and then work your way up because i would assume the more playlists you're on the more attractive it looks to the other playlists too yeah and this is something i tell people all the time like you know that one playlist that has a ton of followers that might be like really enticing and like, it, that's kind of like the get rich quick, like, like scheme, yeah. but there's, there's, there's nothing like, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to like 10 small playlists. And mm -hmm. there's definitely like, you're going to get the same effect. And what I tell people is you might even get a better effect. And this is, this is like factual, like 10 playlists are like, even if they're small, getting into 10 is going to boost your, your playlist algorithm a lot more than just one big one. Because Spotify might not necessarily pick up on how many followers the playlist has as much as the fact that you're getting into multiple playlists and people are loving the music and they're adding it to their routine listens. And so it's almost sometimes better to focus on multiple smaller playlists as opposed to one big one. And my suggestion would be to try both. Like just start, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it costs 20 bucks and there's like, oh, there's no playlisting there's no playlisting resource or platform that's that accessible right now. Most of them are upcharging like way, like they're making it seem like it's an industry professional thing. And, you know, just you can hop on there and you could just get straight to it. You run a couple searches and you just start sending emails and you just learn, you just learn like, okay, this is, this is how people in my genre respond. This is how people who handle the playlists in my scene respond. And I've, you know, I've, I've talked to artist managers who are good friends of mine who kind of use this tool in like folk and country. And they're repeatedly surprised by how often people are just looking for good music and how happy they are to just talk to someone who's like influential in their genre. And then in the genre I work in, like, you know, with hip hop, it's a lot more saturated. There's a lot more playlists. 
and it's it is a lot more of a numbers game you want to just reach out to as many as possible and just like cast a wide net and so yeah my advice would be you know definitely don't think like okay i'm only going to focus on playlists that have ten thousand. hit up a hundred playlists that have one thousand or five hundred or focus on the even even a smaller one like there is say you have a brand new release if you can get 10 playlists that have 20 followers in that first week, it might do more for your algorithm than getting in one playlist that has 10,000 just yeah. because of the way the algorithm works. And so, yeah, definitely like, you know, do everything. <laughs> yeah. And I always, I use the word getting, getting reps in um, it's like a little training analogy, but exactly. It's all about getting those reps, right? So if you are first starting out, reaching out to people for the first time, get those reps in with those playlists that don't have as many followers. Cause you don't want to be wasting those reps when you have no idea what you're doing yet, reaching out to these bigger playlists and then now have lost your chance to reach out to them in the future. Um, so get those reps in. You got to do the work for sure. Exactly. And, and I yeah. do have a, a, like two or three quick fun questions before I ask you the, the last one. Um, so first one is what is the first concert you've ever been to or your first memorable concert experience? Um, wow. I, um, you know, the first concert I went to, like, it was probably something at the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, I actually, I played drums and I've, I've oh, cool. been in jazz band my entire school. Like, like, in, in, like, I went to, uh, like, whenever I was in school, I was in jazz band or I was in orchestra or I was doing percussion of some form. So my first concerts were probably like school concerts, but the okay. first memorable concert was a Def Leppard concert. Oh, cool. um, and I actually remember uh, the most memorable part to me was like, just like I, you know, the drummer, I believe he's like missing a limb and you know, he never missed the beat. And I like, I, I, it was just like, I, I was young and impressionable. And I like, you know, that music is iconic. And, you know, at, at, there was a point, you know, everyone goes through phases with music. Like you, you start like, you know, listening to like classic rock and queen, and then you go into listening to metal and then you listen to punk and then you come, you know, everyone goes through like the different phases. And I was in a phase when I was younger where I love that kind of music. And yeah, de that Def Leppard show was like super stand out to me. I was just like, yeah, <laughs> I was, it was that like when I, when you asked me that question, that's the first thing that came to mind. And I like th that, the visual of like being in like in front of that stage, was like the first thing that came. So yeah, that's probably the, the first. And like, yeah, that was a really important one. Another one I just thought of was I, I went and saw, um, I saw Kendrick Lamar the oh, night so before good. good kid mad city dropped oh wow. um yeah and he didn't play any of like the new tracks but that was like a super iconic concert and i remember being in line for that concert and someone drove by in like a blacked out like car and just threw a handful of cds at us and one oh, of the wow. cds was problems first mixtape and problems like another super iconic la rapper who i ended wow. up listening to and who since had like a fantastic career but just like i just remember like you know, I, I didn't know how, in, like, how pivotal, like, that, like, how Kendrick was about to be, and, you know, I, I was, like, a huge fan, but it was, like, it was the night before, like, he kind of changed the world, and at the same time, I also got, like, I was in line for that, like, life-changing, world-changing moment, and I got literally thrown at me another artist's music, and, yeah, there's, like, there's a lot to say on that, too, about, like, you know, sometimes you literally just got to get out there and throw your music at people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So you're, you're someone that seems to really love like all music. So playing in jazz, first concert is Def Leppard, you work with hip hop artists. And then I don't know if you either run this blog or work with this blog, but all metal, everything, a trap metal blog. Yes. Like, what, yeah. What, what is trap metal? Like what I think about, about is um, I, I promoted a show a long time ago. My first shows I ever promoted this is a band called Broken Side. I don't know if you know of them. But that's what yes. I think of. What is that? Is that a spot on? Like what's what trap metal is? Broken Broken Side is definitely like it's kind of like what would now be kind of cat categorized as old school trap metal. And okay. like th those guys definitely like to you know they like to think of themselves probably as like the founders of that genre. But it goes way back. Like I, I'm I'm a huge metal head. Like mm -hmm. I listen. Like I there, a day doesn't go by where I don't listen to like Lamb of God or Tool oh, nice. and like. I de you're definitely right. Like I li like I like good music. I don't mm -hmm. I don't have I don't listen to any particular genre exclusively. And yeah, that that project was a couple years ago. Um, one of the developing acts I'm working with, and I still work with, and just kind of like me, just like watching like the the music world like change. Like I kind of recognized um, like how that kind of that kind of like very intense like mixing of rap and metal was going to be relevant and this was long before Takashi like went viral and was like a household name 
And yeah, I like, I, I noticed that in particular there, you know, the blog scene was like, was kind of losing. It's like the, the blog scenes almost evaporated. Like there's very few, like there's very few music blogs. Like there are good ones. Like I listen to, I like, I like listen to and watch and like read passion of the Weiss. And there's, a, there's still good music blogs but like they're, they're few and far between. And this was one genre that never ever had a music blog period. And so I just decided to start one. And it started as like me just having like an extra Instagram account and like an alias. And like, I brought on a few different team members and yeah, I have a partner for that project as well. Someone who's also like really ingrained mm -hmm. in the scene, but yeah, I, um, it's just kind of like this new age, like fusion of rap and metal. Like there's artists like Zilla Kami. Um, you've got artists like, you know, uh, one artist I work with is Loco with the mask. Um, a, a common one right now, like that people have heard of is Mario Judah. And there's kind of like a, there's kind of like a big appeal in, in this genre and, and people still really don't understand it and they don't understand the roots of it. But, you know, before Broken Side, there was DMX. And right. there's people yeah. who have been kind of applying like more like, you know, horror core elements and more brutal vocal elements in rap for a long time. And the genres are like, the genres have merged for a long time. And it kind of just, it didn't reach that kind of like mainstream viral kind of like success until recently. Like obviously DMX massive, but right. you couldn't call, you, would, you wouldn't call DMX metal music. Like you might call like, like Takashi or uh, Mario Judah. Like these are artists that are like screaming in their, in over, over 808s and trap beats. And it's, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a totally new world. And I think a lot of people, who, who might not have been metal fans in the past, they didn't see this coming and they don't expect it. And I know so many industry people who don't get it. Like they just don't understand. Like they don't understand like the, the you know, the, 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 the rapper who's now wearing like punk and horror core like outfits and like the aesthetic of like metal. And yeah, it's, uh, it's really cool. I'm, it, for me, it's like, I'm, I'm like all, I'm cheesing. Like I'm all, I lo I'm loving it. Like, I think it's like the coolest thing ever. Like my two favorite genres are now like merging into one. Yeah. And like some of these artists that are coming out of it are so incredibly talented. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's like, it's, it's awesome. It's a new genre kind of, but it's been around for a long time too. Well, you're going to get a new follower here. Cause I, 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 I was kind of merging two of my favorite genres as well. And I can, I can yeah. definitely see, uh, people moshing to DMX these days. If DMX wasn't his prime, I could definitely see people moshing, getting crazy at a, at a DMX show. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I have, a, I have a band for you. It's not necessarily metalcore, and you probably know them already, but no, I, when it comes to me with metal, it's like the music's just really important to me, and, and the growling and the screaming is a little tough for me sometimes. I guess there's a few where I make these exceptions, like Kill Switch Engage, but um, mm -hmm. Animals as Leaders, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with them or a fan of them. It sounds, it sounds super familiar. Is it prog metal? I would assume so. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with like all the different subgenres, genres, metal, yeah. but it's it's instrumental um, and okay. like just very technical. Like it's really yes. good. Like if you're a musician, you you would enjoy those guys. I'll I'll definitely check it out. Animals as leaders. Animals as leaders. Yeah. I'm first. Yeah, I'll listen to that today. I like. Yeah, I love Opeth and um, Between the Buried and Me is one of my oh, favorite yeah. bands. And you'll, you'll like I, them. I, hell yeah. I, the technical stuff is really like it. I, people people overlook metal for that reason, like because of the growling and the screaming and like, you know, sometimes like the, the emotional like charge and like the mood stuff, it, it doesn't fit for everyone. But as a musician, looking at the technicalities, some metal music is, is more technically involved than like oh, classical yeah. music. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's, it's often overlooked, but there, there's some, it's some, it's, some of it's really, really quality. And like, yeah. you know, like I think of, I think of my, the, the people when I think of as being like the best drummers in the world, most of them are rocking like a double bass and most yeah. of them like they're, they're doing like polyrhythms over like metal tracks. Like they're not playing like, you know, typical stuff. And yeah, there's, there's definitely like a, a super overlooked, like technical talent in that genre in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you have to let me, if you check them out, you have to let me know what you think. And then, I for sure will. And then just be respectful of your time. And we're a little over the question I ask everyone at the end is what is your definition of making it? You know, I, I have like a, a kind of a, you know, my definition of making it is, is, is making music and making like art in general that you feel good about and is influential, whether that's influential to you. And it's something that's like, you know, something that could be like, it's, it's therapy for you and it's a way for you to reflect and it's a way for you to like keep going forward. Or if it's something that influences other people and becomes something that they use to go forward. 
I think that's really like what making it means to me. And, you know, everything else follows that. And as someone that's like pretty involved in the business side of things, a lot of people will tell you that making it is like where your music makes money and like where you're, you're able to have a career off of your artwork. But like, you know, think of some of your favorite artists, whether they're music or whether they're painters, some of these people, their artists, their music, like their content didn't like have monetary value hundreds of years later. And like, it took like a, a thousand years before people were like, oh, actually this one right here, this is worth a million bucks. But like that person still made it and they made it to a, a point where like it was good enough for them and it, it, they kept doing it. And people like people, uh, you know, it might've not been influential to their peers, but it was influential enough to them to like do it. And so, yeah, I would say making it is like, you know, creating something that's influential, whether that's to you or to other people. And yeah, you know, part of it's also just doing it. Live the life you love.